you not worried when you took that early lead that maybe it's too much adrenaline, <laughs> we're gonna burn out, maybe we should just slow this down a little bit, rein it in? I'll, I'll tell you about that. Uh, so we, we got to 500 meters in and we had a lead. And our strategy was to, at about 600 meters in, just go. And we took off and the crew was in a fantastic rhythm boat just leapt away from the pack and when we got to the halfway point the thousand meter mark uh, we had just slight open water just a slight gap between <laughs> our stern and second place's bow and my my first thought was oh no check the cadence make sure that we've come down enough to sustain it all the way through. cadence is the number of strokes per minute the number of strokes right. per minute right and normally uh 36 to 37 strokes a minute was sort of our that was where we wanted to be in the middle of the race and if you're up at 40 strokes a minute in the middle of the race that means you're gonna die you know somewhere in there sure. it's just gonna all come apart and i went oh no quick check it because that's something i'm responsible for controlling and i looked down and it said 36 i said Okay, we're fine. <laughs> and so my my next thought was, if we don't screw this up, we are going to win this race. Right. Now that's not something you can say to a bunch of athletes who are you know two and a half minutes away from the finish line because you don't want someone to get that in their head. Right. So I just said, guys, just keep going, keep going. This is fantastic. And then we took our second attack, and the the aim of that second attack was really just to prevent anybody from coming back on us. Prevent any counterattacks. Exactly. Prevent any counterattacks. And we did a pretty good job with that. So when we got to about 600 meters, maybe 700 meters to go, it was about, it's inside two minutes away from the finish line. Uh, we still had a substantial lead. And I, I kept looking this way, because I was sure it was gonna be the Germans or the Canadians or the Australians that were gonna cause trouble. And all of a sudden, I just hear somebody say, Dutch. Like I hadn't been looking that way, because they were, they were gone. And I turn and look, and I see, Okay, they're coming up, and so it was the Dutch bow ball, uh, just the you know very front of the boat. And I thought, okay, that's fine. You know, we're we're closing in on the finish line, and they're they're pretty far back. We we can manage this. And then the Dutch just started charging, and our, our race plan was set up such that we were going to initiate our sprint with about 500 meters to go, so a quarter of the way to go in the race, about a minute and 23 seconds. And so we went, and that stopped them, and then they started coming again. And our next move was not until 250 meters to go, which is maybe like 42 seconds, and they were coming like crazy. And you can't really alter the race plan in progress, right? So you have to... You know, leave the plan in place. Well, you leave the plan in place, but you, you have the opportunity to say something clever, I guess. And so I said, guys, we are one minute away from the Olympic gold medal. And... The that Dutch, calmly, or were you screaming at it? No, no, I said it, I said it about that calmly. Uh, I said it loud, of course, but very calmly. Sure, yeah. The Dutch were coming, and then all of a sudden, the guys were just like, mm. and the Dutch went back, and next thing we knew it was 250 meters to go, it's 30 strokes, 40 seconds, and the stroke man, Brian Volpenheim, really sort of just took charge from there. He looked this way, saw the Dutch, looked that way, saw the Australians, and said, I have control. I know how to get so us you're home. you're communicating in the race. Yeah, well, mostly at that point by eye signal, but right. it was kind of a nod. I said, okay, good. And then we, we took our final shift with about 15 strokes to go, so maybe only, you know, 30, 30 seconds. And as you crossed the line, you jumped into his arms. Of which course I did. <laughs> of course I did. That, that was the best part. Was that part. a plan, or you don't uh, dare think no, about no, that No, no, you, sort of you don't dare think about those things. It was just an emotional moment. Yeah. He was part of the Sydney crew, as was the three-seat Christian Aarons. Uh, my, I think the, the most proud part of, of that is that watching the video, the three guys to celebrate first were the three guys from the Sydney 8. So Volk got his hands up, I got my hands up, and Christian got was his Christian hands up. Was Christian the guy who jumped in the water? No, no, that was the bowman, that was Jason Reed. But the, the three of us were absolutely ecstatic. And in a way, uh, you know, we, we, carried that, uh, we carried that blame for the guys who chose to retire or, or didn't make it on and they kind of won it for them. yeah yeah uh, I think that, that's fair to say that they they were uh, they were very much in my heart that morning uh, you have written that what I love about watching the Olympics is not seeing people win but seeing people forget for a few minutes that anyone is watching as they put years of preparation and their very souls in the line having been called to competition given day at the
given hour, the colours they wear are forgotten, as they stretch to touch immortality, if ever so fleetingly. In those moments, they are as exposed and vulnerable as they will ever be, and when it's over, they can look back with pride that they had the guts to try, having known no guarantee of victory, and having conquered their fear of coming up short. Do you think if you hadn't won in Athens, you would have stayed with that pain still burn? Would you have been able to retire or would you keep cocks until 78? <laughs> I don't know. Unfortunately, I never have to answer that question. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the easy way out on that one. But right. uh, I, I do think that's true. The, the admirable thing about the athletes who go to the Olympics is they that they do it because they love it. And when you're out there, you are absolutely blinded to anything. You just want to give your best performance. And when you're, you're fortunate enough to do it, yeah, you are You are in the zone. I, I hate to sort of shorthand it that way, but it is the, it's the way.